Okay. Right. Well, thanks very much for joining us, everyone. Um, I'm Jo Gray. I'm the CEO of Amend and delighted to welcome everyone here this evening for NETS in RETS. Um, we're looking at neuroendocrine tumours in rare endocrine tumour syndromes. And this is down to tomorrow being NET Cancer Day. And although Amend is a member of the organisers of the Awareness Day, the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance, We've not historically engaged this Awareness Day to any great extent because of the complex nature of the diseases covered by AMEND. Um, so we have asked Professor Miran to come this evening and help clarify the relationship between the two. Um, first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping, which is if you would like to ask a question, um, these will be answered at, at the end. Please use the Q&A. Um, if you move to the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A button. Press on that and you can submit your questions. Please don't use the chat. Um, it's only me checking these. So um, I'll be looking at Q&A, not the chat. Uh, we'll attempt to include as many or answer as many questions as possible, but obviously we can't promise to do that in the time frame. We, we will try. Um, we are recording this webinar, as you probably already know, um, and it will be um, put on our social media and websites for public view. So if you are asking some um, personal information, and you don't want it in the, in the public domain, um, then please be careful what you what you post. And please do provide feedback afterwards. You will receive an email after the conclusion of this webinar, and uh, we'd be very grateful to hear what you think about this, and it may help us to decide whether to uh, run future webinars on different topics as well. So down to the meat and the bones of the thing now. Um, we now have 27 participants, so that's great, um, joining all the time. So I'd like to welcome Professor Karim Miran, and thank you very much for agreeing to do this webinar. Um, we are very lucky um, as a charity to have Professor Miran as our trustee and has been for some years now. Professor Miran, in case you, are, uh, you don't know him, did his endocrine training at the Royal Free Hospital and Bart's Hospital in London. And he is currently Professor of Endocrinology at Imperial College London, where he also serves as a Director of Medical Education and Lead Clinician for Endocrinology. And I have to say there, there are... Um, there are a few endocrinologists who can really explain complex terms as well as uh, Professor Miran. So I'm delighted that he's going to be covering this topic this evening. Thanks very much. Not at all. Thank you, Joe, for that very kind introduction. I've just noticed that somebody has got a sound problem. So I've just typed in that they should check their volume settings because that, I think, might be it. They won't hear this, of course. Right, so here we go. So Nets in Rest, what a great title, Joe. Excellent title. And um, it's 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 actually simply because of different terminology that different people use, depending on their approach to uh, to how they've got into the field, okay? And now, I am very keen to see questions if people want to ask them on the chat, I, I, not chat, sorry, on the Q&A, because I can see that it works because King has got a sound problem and he has used it. Okay, so... Um, let's make a quick start of, uh, of what this is. So the first thing to talk about is what a tumour is, okay, and, and what causes tumours to happen, because it's really remarkable that more tumours don't happen at all. And I say that because if you think about this, right, cells grow in a really organised fashion, right? So things, so my skin is intact. If I cut it, like, like I've drawn on here, right, I cut my skin, remarkably... It heals, and it's a very clever mechanism. So some clots will form down here and stop me bleeding. And then there'll be a thing called inflammation, where cells grow and fill in this gap here over the course of a few days. And proliferation is when new cells at the edge of the cut grow. So these cells are sitting quietly, not growing, and then suddenly they start growing when they need to. And then, and this is the clever bit, when it's healed, the growth stops. And that's what should happen. And the problem is when the growth doesn't stop, 
then you're in trouble because if it keeps on growing, then you'll have problems. And there are different kinds of problems. Sometimes we call it cancer when it goes everywhere. And sometimes it's a benign tumor, it doesn't grow everywhere. But the main thing is recognizing that every cell in your body has the ability to grow when it needs to. So that's the example of skin. There's loads of examples. Let's say you have a fracture, right? Amazing. What happens is there's growth. You've broken a bone. So what happens is it bleeds a bit and then it heals. And what does healing mean? Growth of cells. And really cleverly, bone cells grow here. Vascular cells grow here to make sure you get good blood supply. And this thing called callus is full of calcium. So it draws in the things it needs. New blood vessels, that is cells growing. And then as you see over time, things get better. And eventually it's remodeled and then the growth stops. And that's what happens uh, in normal people. And if the growth doesn't stop, then you have a tumor. And the other place that things are a bit more complicated are in the gut. Okay, now, if you thought the gut was not an endocrine organ, you were wrong. Okay, because the gut has full of endocrine cells. And this, this is the uh, diagram. So the lumen is where your food is going past. And these are some bugs. And then there's a mucus, uh, which protects these cells from being uh, damaged. And these cells are gut cells, okay? And there's these little things called crypts. So it's, it's in other words, it's an irregular surface, but there's different kinds of cells. So these red ones down here are what they call stem cells, okay? And I've got stem. Now, a stem cell is a cell that can change into any format. Then there's these gray enteroendocrine cells, okay? So it's an endocrine organ, and these cells are communicating, sending hormones to other cells. So, you know, if you had a meal, they might make a hormone called GLP-1. Um, if you also have had a meal, they might stimulate the production of other parts of the gut to make, to move or make fluid, okay? So there's lots of endocrine cells here. Now, these cells are growing all the time, much more than other parts of the body, because if you think about it, you're making enzymes that digest food away, right? So let's say you eat some meat. That meat is digested away by all of the, the hormones and, and uh, enzymes in the gut that come out of these things. The pancreas makes lots of them. Now, if you can digest meat, right, this is meat up here, and you break it down to nothing, the same enzymes might digest you from the inside, and that is prevented by this bit of mucus, but also they're growing all the time. So if they are digested, which they often are, then new cells grow, and it grows really fast. So the gut grows much faster than many other parts of the body. It's got to keep on growing through new cells because they've been digested away by uh, the enzymes that digest meat, okay? And you can see the cells are migrating to the surface, and then they they sort of um, commit suicide, they disappear, and new cells are growing all the time, and the, the new cells are digested away, okay? This is normal, this is normal. Now, if you think about it, because these cells are growing much faster than other cells, there is more chance of, uh, abnormal growth and an abnormal kind of cancer. So that's why bowel cancer is quite a common kind of cancer because these cells are growing very fast normally and so there's more chance of mistakes happening. Did I say mistakes? Yes, I did say mistakes. So let's think about what that means. So here's the real thing. So this is a nice cartoon diagram. In real life, okay, this is how it looks. These are the, the villi, okay, and these blue things are the enterocytes and cells of the gut. And then these goblet-shaped cells here, okay? And if you look back to my little diagram, they have the same things here. These green things are goblet cells, and they secrete proteins that protect you. So all these cells are growing all the time and being digested by enzymes all the time. Now, if one of them makes a mistake, you're in trouble. So those cells are all growing. So here's a normal cell, and it divides into two. It divides into two. And then one day, there's a random mutation that happens, and something goes wrong. What happens? The rest of the system gets rid of it. And so you don't have abnormal growth because there's something wrong with that cell. So that's what should happen, right? Now the problem is that we don't just have one mutation. Sometimes you have more than one mutation. So here is a nice normal cell growing like it should, and it'll stop growing when it shouldn't grow. But if you get a mutation, in other words, a bit of radiation or some random event happens that makes this cell have an abnormal mutation. 
I don't know why I'm still doing this. Hang on. Right. Is doing that, okay? Then you might get a second mutation. Okay. And so sometimes more than one random event happen, and even these um, can be controlled, but one day you have too many mutations, and that cell then loses the ability to stop growing. So it knows how to grow, but then it can't stop because the, the genes that control not growing have gone. But you need quite a lot of mutations, so you'll be quite unlucky for all of those things to happen, okay? And that because you need lots of mutations, that's why we haven't all got cancer every day. So most of us don't cancer for a long time. And if one cell, now the key thing is, this is one cell, right? It's not lots of errors, it's one cell that goes wrong. So here is that example, right? So here are these cells with one mutation and then two and then three and then four. One cell has grown, and that cell now can't stop growing. So it becomes two, four, six, and that one cell, okay, has an uncontrolled growth, becomes a tumour. Now, what that means, when I say one cell, that means it's a clone. That means every cell is identical, and all of them have the same abnormal DNA, and they'll all keep growing. So that's where we're in trouble. Now, supposing that cell happens to be an endocrine cell, Okay, because the problem with most cancers is that they just grow and invade, okay, and cause trouble. But if they're an endocrine cell, then they might also make a hormone. And that's what endocrine tumors do. They make hormone. So if you have one of these great, these, these gut hormone cells might make an abnormal gut hormone in the circulation and grow as a tumor, a lump there, okay, so you might see a physical lump, and that would worry you, as a cancer would. But also, if it's making a hormone, then it will start causing symptoms of different types. So one of these hormones might be gastrin. So if that becomes a tumour, you might have a gastrinoma. That's a rare neuroendocrine tumour of the gut. Okay, And these, these grey cells in this diagram here are different gut hormone um, secretors. So... Here I am, here's my, whatever surface this is, might be gut, might be skin, okay? They're all nicely going, nice and normal. And then one cell becomes abnormal. There's millions of going every day, but one of them makes a mistake and it doubles and doubles and doubles. Now, when this happens, I'll have a little tiny lump somewhere in the body and I won't even know about it. I'll be completely fine, okay? Let's say it's in my lung, okay? So I have one cell and it becomes two and it comes when it grows and grows and grows. But I'm fine. It might be quite big. I won't know about it. It's not going to make me ill, okay? Because it's a small primary tumour. So what might go wrong? Well, it might, because there's lots of blood vessels in the lung, and there's lots of airways. Now, if the cancer cells make a bridge between a blood vessel and an airway, then some blood will go into my airway, and I'll cough up some blood. Now, if I cough up blood, I should worry, because if I cough up blood, Either I've got a very, very bad infection, and I'll know that, so I'll feel rubbish, but if I don't feel like I've got an infection, then that's worrying, because that means there's some abnormal connection. And it might be benign, but it might be a cancer that's growing here. So coughing up blood is an early feature. I say early because the first thing that happens, because it takes a long time for this cancer to cause other problems, okay? And if, when I cough up blood, I immediately see someone and get an X-ray, this might have not grown very much, and it might be removable, and it might kill me. But also, it might grow down the airways and down the blood vessels, and it might spread. And if that has happened, then I'll need something to kill the cells that are not in the lung, like chemotherapy. But if it's a small primary tumour, then it can be removed, okay? Now, the ones that spread that we all really worry about are so-called cancer cells, and that's because they invade and grow everywhere, going to blood vessels, going to bones, and so on. And so if they grow like that, then they'll cause trouble in different parts of the body in different ways, okay? And if you don't know about it, and it's grown in lots of places, then when you find out, you do a whole body scan, you find lots of what we call metastases, then that's, of course, not a good outcome. Now, benign lesions, sound good don't they if you have a benign lesion here's a benign lump um in a bone okay and it's growing quietly it's not causing any trouble at all okay and it might just sit there and if it's not an endocrine cell doesn't matter it might look like this it might look a bit weird okay 
This is in the skin, there's a lot. This is called a lipoma. This is a benign tumor of the fat cells. It's grown a bit. Then leave it alone. Don't need to panic about that because it's benign. It'll never harm this patient because it's on the skin and it's not going to invade. It's got a lovely capsule, nice round circle. It looks a bit odd. We can remove it if you want, but you don't need to remove it because it's benign. However, the same benign tumor in your brain is a big deal because your brain is surrounded by a skull and there's no room for the tumor to grow. In your skin, that's what the same tumor in your brain causes trouble. It causes a midline shift. You know, the middle is pushed sideways. So although a benign tumor histologically is benign, not a cancer, in some parts of the body, it's very serious. Okay. And that also applies to the endocrine organ uh, below the brain, the pituitary, because that's surrounded by bone. And of course, if you get growth in there, it'll affect the function of the pituitary gland. Okay, so now we're here to talk about endocrine problems. Okay, so there are a number of endocrine cells. Um, this is just some of them. Okay, these are the, the so-called early discovered, but there's loads more. Okay, the gut hormone ones aren't on here, right? But um, these, these groups of cells make hormones. If you get a tumor, a cancer cell, or a benign tumor from one of these cells, then you will start to make a hormone and have an endocrine symptom, okay? And because it's rare, we call it a rare endocrine tumor syndrome. And the word syndrome means a constellation of different odd things, okay? So in the past, when we didn't understand what happened, you'd notice that some patients would have the combination of a thyroid cancer and a phycomocytoma. And that was in those days, before we knew what MEM was, it was called a syndrome. They said, he's got a syndrome. He's got a number of different cancers. And do you know what? I've got another patient with exactly the same group. Let's call that a syndrome. And it'll be given a name, right? But now we understand it better. And so it's got a better name. Let's see if anybody got no questions yet. Okay, I'm going to keep looking for questions because if you've got questions, then uh, you should please ask. Okay, so the key thing about these tumors are that they can be benign or malignant, but either way, if they're endocrine cells, they'll make a hormone, and the hormone is the troublemaker in this case. So while cancer is bad because it can invade, benign tumors are not bad unless they cause a space problem. But the third thing is, if they're endocrine cells, then they have a new problem in that they can um, cause a hormone. So let's look at one of these organs at random, and that's the adrenal gland, my favorite gland, and that is, uh, here's a picture of it. It's got several zones, it's very clever. It makes a lot of different hormones. So the outermost zone makes a hormone that controls your blood pressure called aldosterone. And then there's a big chunky middle zone called the zona fasciculata, and it makes cortisol, and that is controlled by your pituitary ACTH. And then the middle bit of your adrenal, the so-called medulla, hence middle, makes adrenaline. And so, you know, when you're under stress or when you're being chased by that lion, fight or fright, the adrenal glands make a load of adrenaline and that keeps you alive. It keeps you able to cope with the stress of uh, either fight the lion or run as fast as you possibly can. But the adrenaline gives you the ability to do that. It's a very important organ. Okay. Now, supposing one of those cells uh, becomes tumorous, okay, one of these cells in the medulla becomes a tumor and grows and doubles and doubles and doubles and, doubles and gets bigger, you have a adrenal tumor, okay, and that adrenal tumor uh, can make lots of hormones, and this is American for adrenaline, okay, and this is the normal effect, so here I am walking around, and then I see a lion, and the lion scares me, and that sends a message to my sympathetic nervous system, we send the message to my adrenal band to push out a load of adrenaline, and that gives me the ability, because what it does is my blood pressure goes up, my heart rate goes up so I can run, my metabolic rate goes up, I breathe more deep so I get more oxygen, I liberate glucose to fight that lion, and my brain is hyper switched on by the adrenaline, okay? And then I burn out some fat to have some energy ready, and um, all of this keeps me ready to pounce or whatever I need to do to keep alive. Okay, that's what adrenaline normally does. And when the line goes away, this all turns off and I'm back to normal. Now, if I have a tumor of this, of this, then of course it will become 
make more and more adrenaline. Now, I don't know if you guys like House. I've got a one minute clip from House uh, just to see what you think. Okay, do you mind if I play? I hope you can um, oops, hear the sound. Here we go. And I started feeling real nervous. This guy was staring at me. I could feel his eyes digging holes in the back of my neck. Made me feel crazy. S sweat was pouring down my face. I could hear my, my heartbeat racing in my ears. I, I just raged out on the dude. So what's the differential for raging out? Excess testosterone, steroids, adrenaline. Prep clearance for surgery. Care to share with the class? Oh, come on. Let me spell it out for you. Pheochromocytoma. I'm not sure how you spell it. But you said it yourself. Adrenaline. Pheochromocytoma sits on top of the adrenal gland, randomly spits out oodles of the stuff. It's perfect. Explains everything. The tachycardia, pulmonary edema, the vasoconstriction, the cause of the necrotic bowel. Even explains how he had the strength to rip the rail off his bed. It feels extremely rare. I love rare. Did you hear that? I love rare. Okay, so these are extremely rare tumors. And that is the key, key thing about some of these uh, these things. Okay, they are very rare. Stop. And oops, I saw about that. I should stop that and move forward. Okay, so this is one of the many rare tumors. Now, the two questions in the chat I can see one from, one from Lizzie saying, What content cell damage? So, cell damage, um, there's two things. Um, any inflammation so if you cut the skin okay then cells will start growing because the damage happens to some cells on the inside and, and some enzymes leak out and um, irritate the cells around there the other thing about cell uh, cell that i think you'll find is dna so that is i'll just go back to that i think i know what you're asking me oops Um, this oh yeah so this is this is usually radiation okay this is that's what that is so radiation um is a central dna mutation okay and then there's a second question tracy how should a patient be scanned after non functioning that's a good question okay i'll answer that in a minute let's just get back to um oops let me play that again okay so basically here is the tumor that's uh, the pheochromocytoma and um, it can be benign or it can be malignant and it's malignant it spreads. Now this was written, this was written uh, before we knew what MEN was, okay? This is from, in fact, my father's textbook from 1950. And it quotes adrenal pheos as occurring in 90% and 10% not in the adrenal. And then it says here, bilateral 10% higher in children. Now, of course, it's clear now that this must be MEN2, okay? Because why would it happen on both sides in 10% of people? It's not 10% really, but um, this is a long time ago, but basically there's some clues that they didn't quite know what it was, okay? So this is a fearful cytoma, and sometimes it can spread. These blue blobs are where you can get primary paragangliomas, as you're calling them here, extra outside the adrenal, okay? So, what would happen in the old days was patients with a fear would have episodes of severe hypertension like this, come and go, come and go. And when you saw the patient, they would have headache, dizziness, sweating. If they've got a number of these things together and high blood pressure, they'd say they've got this syndrome that causes episodes of hypertension. Okay. And now we know that's caused by a fear. Okay. And sometimes they pass some glucose out. Okay. So it's a rare endocrine tumor. The benign tumour is also a neuroendocrine tumour. Now, why is that? That's because these cells have got nerves, as you said, going to them to tell them when to fire, and they're endocrine cells, hence the term neuroendocrine tumour. So, of course, if you're a pathologist and you're looking at the cells, you'll look at it and you'll see neural cells and endocrine cells, and you will call it a neuroendocrine tumour. If you're a patient... Um, you wouldn't mean that's quite boring. What you want to know about is, is it common or rare? It's a rare tumour and it makes a hormone. And so that's why there's these two names for really what is the same thing. 
Is there any, any, any other question? Okay, so here we go. There's very specific questions coming up now. Okay, so let's let's start with uh, Jane's question. At what stage of having a net would be determined that you have cancer? Okay, so a neuroendocrine tumour might be benign or it might be um, malignant, depending on the primary in the gut. So, for example, if you have a gastrinoma, there's a good chance it would be benign. If you have a pheo, it's 90% benign, okay? So for each of the primaries, there's a different risk depending on what type you have. So when you have a gut hormone tumor, um, a net, we will scan you. We'll look at, if we get a sample, we can look at the cell growth and the pattern. And if the pattern looks like they've got lots of what they call mitosis, lots of growth potential, then that makes it look like a cancer. But the definition of a cancer is when the cell has moved to another part of the body. So if I've got a net, in my gut and it's forming a lump it might never move i always say that's a benign one but if one of the cells goes to the liver then it's a cancer by definition okay now the other thing about nets unlike lung cancer or skin cancer which are highly malignant and kill people very quickly luckily neuroendocrine tumors grow but very slowly so even if you have a cancer of a neuroendocrine tumour, because they are much slower growing, your prognosis is a lot better than normal lung cancer or bowel cancer or breast cancer. So those three, bowel, breast and lung cancer, are pretty aggressive and in some patients quite quickly fatal. Whereas neuroendocrine tumours, even if you don't know you've had one for a long time, and even if they spread to the liver, they grow so slowly that we can operate and remove them and keep people well for several years, even with the cancer forms. Now, some of them start growing faster, and then you've got to start using chemotherapy, which kills the dividing cells. Now, you think about it, if you've got a cell that's dividing rapidly, like a cancer, we use chemotherapy that kills dividing cells. And if you kill dividing cells, you're going to kill gut cells, because they're dividing quite fast. And that's why people have so much vomiting, because you're killing the gut cells when you give people chemotherapy. Now, the newer chemotherapy is much better because it's less, less kills of dividing cells. Now, let's see what I've got on the questions here. So, how often should patients be scanned after a non-functioning paracamp is removed? Okay, so, um, you see, the answer to these questions about frequency is about risk, okay? And the thing is that if you have a non-functioning paraganglioma, if you have a mutation, then depending on that mutation, so if you've got an SDHB or SDHD mutation, the risk starts to rise of a recurrence, okay? So if you've got a genetic cause, then depending on the mutation, so if you've got SDHB, you want to have scans more often than if you have SDHD, which is a much less um, common recurrence, but they do recur. So we kind of make that up because I'll tell you why, right? Supposing I have a scan today and there's no tumours, it might start tomorrow. And so we have intervals that we kind of make up, which are which are a balance between not being scanned every day and not being scanned every five years, depending on the frequency. We want to catch it before it's spread. So for some of the cancers, we might say one year. So for SDHB, we might have a different frequency to one of the different types. So for each mutation, if you've got a mutation, there is a defined, and that, I, admittedly they're made up by experts who've said, look, we've noticed the patient with MEN2, this is how commonly they have fears that spread. So we recommend that you scan the patient this frequently, okay? So if you have a mutation, then that is easy because it we can compare to other patients. If you've got no mutation, we'd call it sporadic, which means one random mutation has happened, then it happens to be a neuroendocrine tumour um, that's growing. Um, so at what stage do you normally do genetic testing? So it's changing, it's getting better and easier, okay? So the reason this is important, right, is that in the past, we had different labs around the country doing their own thing, right? So, so for example, we one lab with an interest in let's say MEN1, and they would only screen for MEN1, and they would set up their own guidance and say, look, anybody who needs a test, 
send it to us and we'll do it. And it will cost the hospital this much money. So it's got much better than that because everything is centralized. And instead of saying, because if you have a FIO, chromocytoma, it might be to MEN2, it might be to a different gene called NF1, it might be to a third gene. Um, so there's no different genes that cause it. So what you would have done is go through the history and try and guess what the syndrome is. And if you think of MEN2, then you send the MEN2 gene. Now it's much better. If you have a FIO, there's a central UK laboratory, and any FIO, if you have fulfill certain criteria, they'll do all the gene in one go. It's done centrally by UCL for most genes, and then they they don't do the, the, the test there. They send the, they've got one lab in the country for each gene, and they use those laboratories for that one patient, and it all goes in one go. So it, so it's much better um, to to now to get gene testing. It's much easier for me too because I used to have to do all kinds of blood tests and work out which lab to send it. Now it all goes one tube goes and the central coordinates send it to the right labs for me, which is much better. So it's getting easier because of course we can now do whole genome sequencing. And I think what well, that means is right. This is amazing. That means you can take one cell and sequence the whole genome looking for all the mutations they have. We don't do that because we find lots of abnormal genes that mean nothing. Uh, when I say abnormal, they're not typical of a certain sequence, and so they're called variants of unknown significance. So they're not the same as the common gene, but they're not abnormal. There's a spelling mistake in it. Um, Kinga's asking, is it common to have high blood pressure and heart rate with MEN1? Um, well, um, bear in mind that high blood pressure and heart rate are very, very common in normal people, okay? So high blood pressure is something that, that most GPs know all about and will treat with treatments, okay, with, with drugs very effectively, and the same with heart rate. So it probably is not linked to the MEN1. It's just common in all of us to have high blood pressure and a heart rate. Um, so it, it, that's not a feature that I would look for in particular. MEN1 has got its own features, as you know, um, parathyroid, pituitary, and pancreatic lesions. That's what I'd look for. So if you have MEN1 and you have a high blood pressure, it's important to realize that you are allowed to have all the diseases that the rest of us have, okay, if you have MEN. Um, right, let's have a look. If you had a fear, could you present low blood pressure? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So, so the thing is, I'm going to just go back um, to show you something. You see on this, this is a very old slide, right? But the person who wrote this noticed that some people had intermittent, really severe high blood pressure, but later on in the disease, it became sustained, and sometimes it would drop. So, so you can have a fear that is making other hormones, for example, um, dopamine that causes hypotension. So the answer to the question is yes. Jane, do patients often know they don't? So this is the problem with cancer cells of all types, right? Pain is a very late feature. It's a very horrible feature when it happens, but it's very late. So when you have that first cell that's growing in your lung, you have no idea until it invades the blood vessel and you cough up blood. That's a good clue. And if it doesn't invade the blood vessel, it might grow and spread around the body. So it, it can grow a long way. I mean, I've certainly seen patients who we found they've come in with one problem. You scan them, oh my gosh, there's all these myths. And they have no idea and they're not even ill. But the problem is trouble happens quite soon afterwards because lots of things start to go wrong. If it's in your liver, for example, the liver will stop working. You might get liver failure or... Um, if it goes into bone, so pain, the, the, the pain of malignancy in cancer is, is usually bone pain because when cancer cells grow in bone, that really hurts, okay? And it's it's the bone pain that causes a lot of, uh, of problems um, and the, the pain that is more painful. The other theo, are metanephrines always high or... Yes, they can. You see, that's what this slide is, episodes, right? So you sit there with a normal blood pressure and the tumor sitting there and it suddenly decides to degrade it to release hormone because it thinks may maybe it's hit by the uh, lion threat 
And but the difference is, unlike the normal adrenaline, it's a big tumor, the adrenal pheo. And so the whole thing will is much more adrenaline than a normal amount. And you get this really severe blast of hypertension. And this is this is 300 over 150. This is this is like not high, really high. Okay. Oh, it says okay. Are there any other questions? Um, or shall I keep going? I think I've got a few more slides. Yes, oh, just to say, obviously, for a FIO, you can, for any endocrine uh, tumour, you can use drugs to block the symptoms of the, of the uh, tumour, and then you can use a surgeon to remove it. And the surgery will, of course, cure you if it's benign. Um, if it's heritable, if you've got a gene for it, then you might get another one, okay? How do you find a good centre? Okay, so a good centre is defined as a place that sees lots of patients with that condition. And so what will happen is if you go to your GP, they might refer you to a local centre, but if they recognise it as something they can't handle, they'll refer you on to a tertiary centre, okay? Adrenal tumours, yes. So MEN1, it does cause adrenal tumours. They're not functioning, though, okay? So it is interesting. MEN1 has got a number of features not that I haven't talked about. I just talked about the endocrine ones. But actually, um, patients with MEN1 definitely, because I've noticed many of them, when you scan them, have got adrenal tumours, but they're non-functional tumours, and you don't need to do anything about them in most cases. I think there was a question I didn't answer. Um, I'm looking at the answer questions now. Cancer we talked about. MEN1. Yeah, we've had that. You don't get pain with a tumour, you get pain much later on. So pain is a it is confusing. Okay. Okay, so, so rare endocrine tumours. So what are the ones that we see? Okay, so the ones that occur are the pancreas, um, they're rare. The pituitary, I mean, for us, they're quite common, but they are rare in the general population. So they are still rare tumor syndromes, and they're endocrine because they make hormones, okay? The parathyroid is a really good example of, I would say, a not very rare tumor syndrome. So parathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism, we have a benign tumor of your parathyroid gland that makes PTH, is actually quite common. And undiagnosed, there's people out there who've got a high pH and a high calcium who don't know. And the tumor is really quite small. It's not a big tumor that's going to make them notice. It's a small tumor. The problem is if you leave it alone, it causes a lot of trouble because it leaches calcium out of the bone and causes stones. So as I was saying earlier, when a pathologist looks at cells, they're named neuroendocrine tumors. And when you look at it, you call it a rare endocrine tumor syndrome. Should patients with non-functioning tumors therefore be scanned everywhere? No, no. So, so here is the key, right? Whenever you do a test, you will find a result. And the result has got what I would call some a rate of false positives. In other words, you see things that you worry about that you shouldn't worry about. And the adrenal gland is one of those, right? So, so we have a lot of incidentally found adrenal tumours in the general population with no endocrine tumour syndromes at all because we scan people, okay? And we scan people who I think shouldn't be scanned. Um, and that's because you were worried. You were worried, I think I'll do a whole body scan just to see. And then you know what? Oh, there's a, there's a tumour in the adrenal gland. And that's worrying, because it might be cancer. The chances of cancer is 0.01%. That means you do 10,000 scans, 9999 are completely benign tumours, okay? But one of the tumours might be a malignancy. So it's a real worry, but it's very unlikely to be. Um, so if you scan people everywhere, you're going to find a lot of false positives. And I know that it's harmful. I'll tell you why. Because patients with fault positives sometimes have surgery that they shouldn't. And that can be harmful. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute if you like. 
Um, okay, so would the tumors all present on scans if they are causing symptoms? Generally, yes. If they're causing symptoms, then they'll be quite big. We need to know where to look, right? So our scans have got really quite sophisticated and good. So if we know that you've got a high calcium, the scans for pathoglans are incredibly good, okay? And they do a set MIDI scan, and you can see a pathoglanoma and an ultrasound, and then you can just remove that benign pathoglan and control the, the calcium, okay? So they're usually visible. You need to know where to look for because obviously if you have a high calcium and you don't look in the neck, you're not going to find it. So it is important to know where to look. Whole body scans are a really bad idea if you have if you don't know what you're looking for, because you're going to find things that are of no consequence. I'll give an example, right? Um, I had a patient who had, he didn't have any syndromes, okay? He was completely well man, and he had a lumpy thyroid gland, a so-called multinodular goiter, okay? And uh, he was quite a bit lumpy, thought it could be cancer. And I examined him and he felt like a benign multinodular goiter, okay? So he said, um, I'm a bit worried about this. I examined him and said, look, this is totally benign. You should keep your thyroid gland because it's not cancer, because it didn't look or feel like cancer. And multinodular goiters are really common, okay? Anyway, he then got worried about it and went to see a lot of different private surgeons. And one of them said, I can remove it if you want. He didn't say you need to remove it, he said, I can remove it if you want. And then the patient said, could it be cancer? Now, I'd said, no, it isn't cancer. But that surgeon said, you never know. He didn't say it was cancer, he said, you never know. And the patient said, I want it removed. So the surgeon said, all right then, um, you pay your money, you get your thyroidectomy. So he had his thyroid removed. And good news... There was no cancer in the thyroid gland. So it's a good news, Mr. X. Your thyroid gland did not have a cancer in any way, but never mind, because uh, you can have thyroid in the present forever now. And then and then he said, and by the way, accidentally, we removed the power thyroid glands as well. But don't worry about that. The physicians will look after you. Now, that was not a fair thing to say to me at all, because, of course, it does mean that he can never stop taking calcium and one alpha and other treatments. So this completely normal man with a benign nodular goiter, because he was scanned, had an operation that has been life-changing. He can never stop calcium, because if he does, he gets tetany and hypocalcemia, and it's too much calcium constipated. So he said to me, do you know, I wish I'd never seen that surgeon. And that is the point about scanning people without the right plan. Okay, let's move on to Jane's question. So... Um, 50 minutes left. Yes, indeed. How come is MN, in MN1 is it to have lung nets? Um, it's not very common because usually if you're going to have, have a net, it'll be in the gut. Um, it's about one in three of the nets, but but um, not many people have nets at all in MN1 because as you know, the thing that really happens to everybody in MN1 is the hyperparathyroidism. And metastatic endocrine tumors mimic hemangiomas. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we need good radiology to be able to distinguish a cancer from a hemangioma. And it can be difficult. We've got better and better scans that can distinguish blood flow. They'd probably do a CT and an MRI if they're worried about that to distinguish them. Um, stress. Now, stress is what the endocrine system is all about, okay? And stress is, is controlled. You see, we all survive stress because our endocrine system makes the hormone you need to cope with the stress. And so you need to let your endocrine system do its thing and not try and compensate for it. Obviously, stay relaxed if you can, but I mean, using, using drugs and things. So your question is, can stress trigger over the insulin? Not really. Um, insulin excess can be made by an insulin producing tumor, and insulin no, that's, that is a gut hormone tumor. But stress will make you will make more insulin. I don't. Well, just to explain if you can in the chat in in the uh, question and answer bit, um, what that question is about. The answer generally is that you make insulin when you need it to bring your blood sugar down to normal. So it's not overproduction. It's very very well regulated. In MN1, you can have overproduction if you have an insulin producing tumor. 
Okay, so let's then move on to the genetic syndrome. So you know we talk about these, these cell damage, right? Now, if you have MEN1, then you are born with every cell in this green situation, okay? So in other words, all your cells have got the MEN1 gene mutation. Every single cell in your body has got that abnormal gene, okay? And luckily, without another mutation, you're okay. But you start off at a position of disadvantage. And if this gene is the MEM1 gene, then it doesn't matter in your liver or in your skin, but it does matter in your pituitary, in your parathyroid and your pancreas, because that gene does something, meaning it's called, okay? And that gene does something. I don't think we fully understand what it normally does, but um, you start with that gene as abnormal. And what that means is you need one less set of cell damage. So if you have random cell damage, like anybody up here, okay, you can get normal cancer, but you've got this mutation that affects the three Ps, and that means you need one less mutation to get primary hyperparathyroidism or a pancreatic tumour or a pituitary adenoma. So you've got all the cells sitting there and you're in a slight disadvantage of getting a tumour syndrome, okay? Um, this slide applies to cancer, of course. In your case, these will be benign parathyroid adenomas and benign pituitary adenomas or malignant gastrinomas in some cases. Okay, so Carol's question is, my daughter was in insulin lots of hypos i see um so just, if, you, if you don't uh, just be careful about revealing lots of information right but um um is, is there is there is mn one in somebody who's got an insulinoma because um there might be a government you're making a hormone like glp1 or an insulinoma and that needs to be found and removed. And actually, you know, it's it's probably it's you're saying stress, but it probably is happening all the time. Okay, so MEN one affects pathogen cells, because, so you're starting off here, and those cells might go off. And a different mutation, if you have a, if you are a family with MEN two, if you have the MEN two gene. Oh then your first mutation is a gene that affects the thyroid C cells, hence calcitonin and medullary thyroid cancer, and the parathyroid cells, and the middle the adrenal medulla, that is the risk of fear, okay? So you start off with those mutations, depending on what gene you have. And I'm talking about MEM1, MEM2, there's loads of genes with different mutations that give you a, a group of syndromes that come That's together, good. okay? Now... Now, um, let's see this. Have bread a new level of I can block an enzyme with everyone to depend on. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's another really important point, right? So, so when you have a malignancy and the cells are growing fast, we've got a drug now that stops cell growth, right? Now, the thing about MEN tumors is that MEN tumors grow quite slowly. And so when you have a, a drug that blocks enzymes and slows growth, because the growth is not very high anyway, you need to give quite a lot of the drug to help people with a slowly growing tumour compared to the fast growing tumours. And what that means is you tend to need to have a dose that causes side effects. So, so that's why some of these drugs, we are a bit nervous about using an amium one because if the treatment's worse than the disease, it's a bit of an issue. OK, but yes, it's certainly something that needs to be tried. And what we start doing is use it in patients who have tumours. Well, you see, if you've got a drug that works, then you would use that drug first. OK, because you know it works and you, you, you're not sure about a new drug like this. It's got an interesting potential uh, looking at an enzyme. But if you turn off enzymes, it's got side effects, what I'm trying to say. Okay, It'll have some effects that you don't actually want. But um, it might. It's a good thought. And certainly that would be the hypothesis. And what will happen is they'll use this in first in animals probably to see what happens to those cells. I know that Rice Thacker has a model um, of animals. That are, they're not the same, obviously, as humans. But um, it'll give us a clue. 
So if you have a genetic syndrome, you don't have that first bit on the left, okay? You, you start with all your cells in this position with that one mutation, and that's why you're at risk, depending on what gene you have as to what might happen to you. What actually happens is random. You might get pathoid lesion. You might, because the second uh, mutation is a random event, okay? So you're born with this first mutation, let's say amian one or amian two or something, and so if you have a known mutation, you know what's going to happen. You're at risk of. You don't know for sure, okay? You don't want to remove all your pathology glands because they're doing a useful role when you're young. In fact, a very important role. And when they become tumorous, because you know the other ones might become tumorous, you might think about not having one removed, but having maybe three or three and a half, okay? So if you have the gene for MEM1, and especially if one of your parents has had one of the problems, we then start saying, let's keep measuring the calcium, the plaque, and the pancreas, and scan people looking for the tumours that we know happen. Okay? So for MEN1, that's you check the calcium a lot, you check the prolactin a lot, and you scan the pancreas for the tumours you see in the abdomen, the gut hormone tumours. And you'll pick them up before they cause too much trouble, but you don't want to act too quickly, because if you remove an organ forevermore, that person depends on that hormone. So for MEN2, we measure calcium a lot. Um, we used to measure calcitonin a lot. I mean, we still do measure calcitonin, uh, but now people have a thyroid removed before it causes trouble, which is such a good outcome, okay? Because it actually, it's the, one, it's the one cancer that if you deal with before it's become a cancer, and because the thyroid, unlike the other organs, we have such good replacement thyroxine, you could do that. Okay, we suspect MEN2. If we well, to fear you have it, not really. Okay, so here's a really important point, right? So, medullary thyroid cancer is a feature of MEN2. Thyroid nodules are present in half the population, half the population. Okay, so if five or six people have an ultrasound scan of the thyroid gland, there'll be some nodules, they'll be benign, but it'll be nodular. Okay, and so if you've got thyroid nodules, that wouldn't be particularly in the end too. But if you have on the scan a solid lump, so not a nodule, but something that looks like a, I mean, it looks different to medullary thyroid tumors, which are very rare, hence the word rare, it's a really rare tumor. If you've got MTC, medullary thyroid cancer, then that's in the end too. Um, especially if you've got fever as well. Um, and then you scan looking for all the tumours that you know will happen in someone's got a genetic tumour syndrome. Okay, and in these people, as you know, we call them neurotrophic tumours that occur in these individuals. They can occur in anybody. Okay, so for example, um, gastrinomas occur in patients with MEN1, but also rarely we have sporadic. Now, those people um, happen to have start off here, they happen to have one random mutation that happens at the pancreas and then go down the same track. Really, really rare to have a sporadic because they don't have the first mutation. They've got to get the first mutation sometime in life and then go on to get the other five and then they might get a gastronoma. So it's really rare to have sporadic gastronomas compared to any one patients. Okay, I'm just looking at all these things. So here is about awareness of all these things, okay? Um, and and um, it is important to be aware of this, that we pick this up because, of course, as it says there, it's easily missed. Now, now, of course, the aim is to try and educate people who um, get the syndrome in the first place. One of the problems with this is that anxiety and flushing is common in other conditions like in women, the menopause, okay? Um, and not the anxiety, really, it's, it's the flushing. And so it's much more likely that the patient's got the menopause if they're the right age and they appear to stop, for example. So you first of all want to do that. But um, if all the things are not right, then it is certainly worth thinking about it. Like in that case from a house, you think about it. When house is magic, well, everyone's got a fear, okay? Um, oh, it's a question here. I'm currently... Oh, there's a lot of information about you here. Anyone runs in my family outside of the end being tested? Oh, it's gone. Okay. I'm happy to read it though. Would you read it or? Yeah. Oh, genetics BSC. 
Um, oh yes, do you know what you need to do is join a laboratory um, that um, that is dealing with Amy and one like Rye Stackers, um, Rye Stackers Laboratory. Um, there are many around the country um, that are doing these things, but if you can do that, if you're doing a BSc in genetics, you'll be a very valued individual um, with that kind of information. Here, here's another tricky one, persistent fatigue. Now, the problem with fatigue is it's really common. It's even more common than flushes, okay? I mean, I'm fatigued sometimes, but the word persistent is important. Uh, but a large majority of persistent fatigue patients do not have an intertwined tumor syndrome. Some of them do, but they're going to have a lot of false positives if you use this particular campaign because um, it worries people. Um, and if you scan everyone with persistent fatigue, you're going to find a lot of incidental adrenal lumps that are of no consequence. So we've got to be a little bit careful about... Um, the risk of overdiagnosis in someone who's not got a syndrome. But that's very different to families. If your family have got the gene, then clearly it's worth screening. But if you haven't got the gene, then screening is likely to give you a false positive. It changes the whole, it's a game-changing situation having the gene really. Right, is it an hour yet? Oh, I'm three minutes early. Very good. Okay, so thank you, everybody. So let me see if there's any other questions. Anyone have got any other questions or or thoughts? You can put them in the chat. Not in the chat. Sorry, I didn't say that. I meant the Q and A bit. Okay, so John, this is a good question, right? Uh, Rets. I mean, they are really the same thing. Okay, rare endocrine tumor syndromes. Okay, um, it, it's it's purely because of the different way pathologists have classified things and humans have classified things. I know pathologists are humans, but, but really, um, the thing about rare endocrine tumor syndromes is that we didn't know which ones were caused by what gene in the past, okay? So, so we put together, isn't it interesting, this whole family have got high calcium and they all get palpitations and they all have got this lumpy neck and it's a thyroid cancer, and then they call it a syndrome. And um, when the pathology of the cells, all of those cells have got neural tissue and endocrine cells, and so they'll call it a net, and we call it a ret. Um, so that is the connection, really. Do you know what? They're the same disease. Are there any other thoughts about that? Joe, have you got any thoughts about um, how important and similar they are? No, I mean, I think most of the time I'm, I'm just as confused as everybody else. But I think, you know, yeah, the relation between between uh, nerves and endocrine cells uh, makes it a little bit clearer. OK, if you have MTC. OK, so, so the other thing to say about cancer is that any cancer um, is a mutation. And so anyone who gets cancer is at risk of another cancer happening. OK, so you're, the question is, if you get MTC, if you have a gene that has caused it, then you are at risk of other cancers. And we know about two. We know about MEN2. We know about the sporadic MTC gene mutation. But there are going to be others we haven't found. So if you have got that kind of cancer, a rare cancer, um, you might be, for the genes that we know, negative, but there might be another gene. So the answer to your question is, there probably is a slightly increased risk, but I don't know in whom. Uh, alpha feta protein. This is alpha feta protein is a particular uh, gene for liver tumors. Okay, and um, one of the problems with doing screens of measuring random um, enzymes like AFP is that. It, we don't know what it means unless we know the primary. So I use AFP in patients who've got a particular kind of liver cancer, and you remove it, and the AFP goes down. So the liver cancer makes AFP. And then you screen that person regularly, that one person, because when the AFP goes up, you need to look for the source. Okay, But it's not helpful in the general population because AFP has got a normal regulatory role in the liver. And so, and so if you measure it, someone who's not got liver cancer, you're going to get what I'm going to call a false positive.
Okay, so there's a lot of detail. I'm going to go through these, okay? And I'll go, if that's all right with Joe, is that okay? So, um, so uh, okay, let's talk about paraganglioma for a minute, first of all, right? Um, so paragangliomas are go, go in different parts of the body, and sometimes the tumour itself, it's not the hormone that causes the problem, it's, it's the fact that it grows in a really important part of the body, like blood vessels. So if you've got a tumour growing around your aorta, um, because that's where all the cells are, then it's really hard to remove it because, of course, you need your aorta to supply your body with blood. It's not something that can be just removed. And so the risk, even of the primary, is quite high because of where it is. But if it happens to be away from the aorta, there's no risk. OK, um, the risk of paraganglioma metastases depends on your mutation. So I can't comment specifically. Um, CBT, what does that mean? Is that a special acronym that you know? Don't know. OK, so carotid, that's a bit scary because carotid is the blood supply to your brain. OK, so you've got a pregnant around the carotid. It's going to be tricky to remove. OK, they're going to scan it. They're going to look to see if it's growing in a bad or a good direction. Often it grows so slowly. And so if it's if it's not causing trouble, often leaving it alone is a safe idea. They'll scan it again, look at it, think about the risks and benefits. If it's small, the risk is not needed to take to operate on a thing that's around the carotid artery. But if it becomes life-threatening, then, then you'll have a chat with yourself and think, OK, I'm going to take the risk now. Um, if it's in the neck, I'm presuming it's not making adrenaline because usually the ones that make adrenaline are below the diaphragm in the abdomen. So the neck paragangliomas tend to be non-secretory. And I, I understand why people get anxious because it's worrying. It's not because the tumor is making you anxious. It's because you're worried. That's an appropriate worry, really. Um... Okay, <laughs> and then the booklet. Hang on, I'm, 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 suddenly there's 10, 24 questions. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, I'll use it one by one. I'm much like, but this is Alan Morgan. I'm much like empty to cut in levels. That's actually right. And my thumb powers were removed in surgery. How is it? It's now more or less as much as it would have been a full thyroid. Okay, so. Calcitonin is a very low abundance peptide in normal people. It's a very, very small amount. Okay, you've got very few C cells. So when you have a tumor, it shoots up to really, really high numbers. Okay, so if you have it all removed and there's a few cells left behind, then you'll have a little bit of it. Um, and as long as it doesn't rise, you're okay. So screening with cousins is a really good idea. And it's very, very safe and very effective. And it's really specific. It means that you don't have false positives usually with calcitonin. There's a big advantage of that. Um, oh, I see. Is it? Well, it's got a few thyroid cells remain. So it's not thyroid cells, okay? It's parafollicular C cells. There's a few of these C cells that are still there. And um, they're not, they're not going to cause you harm, probably, because you've had most of them removed. The real reason is that calcitonin is is a very there's very little of it so our acid is really sensitive is what i'm trying to say what's the biggest difference between men vhl carney nf1 okay yes so this is a good question right so there are a number of different genes that's that code for a number of different tumors that but you've included ones that cause fears right so MEN2 and von hippel lindau and nephromatosis all cause fears at different, they're different genes, totally different, different chromosomes even. Um, but if you have any of those genes, you have an increased risk of a fear. So if you have one of those genes, of course, you don't have more than one in one family, but if you've got one of those, then we recognize that we should screen for a fear, okay? And it's about pattern recognition. So when you see MTC with fear, I think in the end too. When I see renal tumours and fears, I think von Hippel-Linda, and especially if they've got cerebellar tumours as well. 
Okay, when you see lumps on the skin, you think NF1, nephromatosis. So, so it's you can recognize it by by the history of the different tumors in the family. Okay, so here's a really good question from Lizzie. Um, MM1 two patient experience, normal person. Yes, we all of us feel tired sometimes, lack of energy. And um, do you think it's necessarily a good idea? Um, okay, so if you've got MEN1, then you are quite likely to have hypercalcemia. And if it rises to a certain level, that can contribute a bit to fatigue. And so it's worth knowing um, if it suddenly gets much worse, whether your calcium is normal or abnormal. And you might find it's totally normal, in which case you know the fatigue is due to something else, okay? Uh, and in NEM1, the three things you screen for are prolactin, calcium, and the image the gut, okay? And and the times, et cetera, doing an extra test won't help, but of course we're screening NEM patients all the time. So we, in fact, you get more blood tests than, than most people. And so um, we, we will have picked that up. You don't need an extra test for fatigue, but you do need the same test as anybody else. So. So, for example, MN1 does not cause hypothyroidism, but life causes hypothyroidism, randomness. So if you get tired and start putting on weight, you might have hypothyroidism, which is nothing to do with MEN, but you're allowed to have that disease. So really important not to get locked into the definitely with MEN1. Um, I know the worry, of course, is that if you are not screened appropriately, then you might have MEN1 and people don't do the right screening, but we've got much better at that now. So people are getting the screen properly. Okay, so Padre in pregnancy. So one of the things about pregnancy is not that it causes any of the tumours, okay? But pregnancy is a time when you start getting tests and scans and regular ultrasounds. And the minute you're exposed to hospitals, you get scanned. And so we find things that have been going for a long time in pregnancy because of being pregnant, because of the fact that we're screening your other bloods all through pregnancy, you're checking your, your not anemic and so on, but also you can ultrasound of your abdomen. Look at the baby, really, but accidentally you might see something behind the baby, and that's where it's picked up, and that's why we think, or people think that it causes it. It's just that we find things in pregnancy rather than it causing it. Um, but when I showed up, my follow-ups. I'm not sure what Lucy's question is. Oh, I see. Breast, breast Please... cancer in MEN1. Right. Okay, so I think the problem with breast cancer, breast cancer, unfortunately, is really common. It's a really common cancer. Two in nine people, women, two in nine women um, will get breast cancer. That's a very, very high prevalence, okay? Luckily, we've got very good at treating it now. Not us. The breast cancer doctors are incredible. They operate. They'll give you surgery, give you chemotherapy. They give you um, radiotherapy too. And I know a lot of people who had breast cancer when they were 50, 40 to 60, who 30 years later, having had surgery and the tamoxifen, all the magic treatments are well at the age of 85, okay? Um, so it's the prevalence of breast cancer in people is very high, and it's the same prevalence in MEM1. It's not caused by MEM1. So what's the connection between NETS and RETS? Well, the answer is they're the same thing uh, named by different people. I have a 9 millimeter leak in my pancreas for my L and ultrasound. But it's not the MRI. Is it fair to the MRI isn't so helpful in any one screening? Uh, no, you need both. Okay, so EUS endoscopic ultrasound sees it from the inside, and so if you've got a very small lesion that's right against the gut, because the pancreas goes right by the duodenum, you're going to see on EUS. Um, there are some tumors that are in the distal part of the pancreas that you see on MRI you can't see on EUS. So we need both, okay? We need the best imaging we can for, for all of you. And so um, if you're suspecting something that's around the head of the pancreas, EOS is better. If it's in the tail, MRI is better. 
um, I think using both should be useful. If it's less than 10 millimeters, intervention is worse than leaving it alone. So uh, we'll have to watch that, won't you? I'm sure you are. Right. Thank you very much, um, Karim, for, for all of that, answering all of that, that flurry of questions there. And hopefully everyone's found that very useful. Um, but I think in the interests of, of time and uh, allowing you to get home and have some dinner or... Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, look, thank um, you for we'll, inviting me. I really, we'll that was really go good. Now. But yes, really thank good you very much. Everybody. Thank that. you all. Okay, thanks. Okay, Bye, everybody. Bye.